Payments company Circle has stopped letting its customers buy and sell Bitcoin because it says it has failed to become a meaningful part of its business. They look at it as kind of speculative or fun, uh, and they're, they're not into that. They're into payments. Instead, Circle has launched Spark, an open source way of using the blockchain to exchange other money in digital wallets. Meanwhile, the R3 blockchain, we've talked about them on Daily Tech Headlines and right here on Daily Tech News Show, uh, launched Corda, an open source blockchain based platform to record, manage, and automate legal agreements between business partners. And I know anybody who's followed this show has noticed blockchain, blockchain coming up more and more. I'm going to try to explain it, Scott. Oh, man. Uh, Let's let's start with the simple version. Do you do you have any? Would you what is your understanding of what the blockchain is? All right. So my limited understanding of the blockchain is, it is a a mechanism by which things can be verified as being a real thing. So it, it's not bad. That's not that that is that is very that is not wrong. Actually, it it leaves out some important details, but nothing you've said is wrong in that, as far as I understand it. All right. All right. So the way we let's let's stick with money, because I think money is the easiest one to wrap your head around and it can apply to things like contracts and, and things uh, later. If I want to send you a dollar okay. right now, even through PayPal. Well, if I'm sending within PayPal, it's not this way. But let's say, you know, you need to pull a dollar out of your bank account and send it to me. A central clearinghouse has to validate that transfer. Mm hmm. So uh, it makes sure like, okay, Tom has a dollar. He's not pretending he has a dollar. Uh, that is exact. That is Scott Johnson's account that this dollar is going to. It's not somebody intercepting the, uh, the dollar. Uh, we're going to validate that. We're going to log that transaction. So if anybody needs to check and make sure that it happened, that we can know it happened. But that third party can be corrupted. Somebody could, could start, you know, get, they could get hacked. It can cause problems. Plus, even more so than that, it takes three days. If you've ever added or, re or removed money from a PayPal account, it takes three days. The reason it takes three days to do a transaction like that is this third-party clearinghouse, mm -hmm. and that clearinghouse charges a fee. So forget any other fees that are involved. There's another cost to doing that way. The blockchain changes that. If I want to send a dollar to you, Scott, a transaction is published on the network that says, Tom send a dollar to Scott. And we want to add that to the blockchain. All right. And then you have all these nodes, which are essentially the computers added to the network. Now, in Bitcoin, anybody can be a node. Uh, but you'll hear about uh, these consortiums and these financial tech places doing their own what's called permissioned networks, which means they control the nodes. They decide what nodes. But it's just computers that are looking at this on the network and saying, oh, okay, uh, let's validate this transaction. We all have a copy of a ledger of all the transactions on the network. So if Tom doesn't have a dollar in his account, I can tell that by looking at this ledger. And if, and if Scott isn't actually Scott, or there isn't any Scott, I can tell that by looking at this ledger. So there are two things that has to happen. One is validate that transaction. And then the other is create an encryption key that binds it to the previous transaction. This is all making sense so far. It is so far, yeah. That right, and then we, what you just said, though. What's that? Because one of the big holdouts on this stuff for me, or at least my grasp of it, has always been, especially with Bitcoin, uh, well, if everyone controls it, then nobody controls it. You know what I mean? Like this feeling of, I'm a big open source guy. I love the idea that everybody's working on stuff and then we're all freely just making software about like a bunch of hippies. But occasionally something like this, which deals with money, which deals with people's livelihoods, which deals with their ability to survive and so on. Um, it kind of freaks me out to think that, well, just any computer can be a Bitcoin node or any computer can be part of the blockchain. Um, and, and, and that's that it just immediately gives me just a little bit of pause. Like, whoa, well, then who's control? Who's watching the watchers? Like, it's that whole thing. Like, how do I know any of this is legit when I when it's everyone can be a thing and no one can be a thing? Um, and so the encryption part seems key to this. Well, the encryption part is really not as key as you think it is. Hmm. The, 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 the key isn't so much like locking the encryption, keeping someone from changing things. The key says we are making sure 
that this transaction follows the previous one. So let's say the previous transaction was Tom got $10 into his account, right? That's a real simple one that you can check and look in the ledger and like, oh, Tom had $10 put into his account. So he can give a dollar to Scott because he's got 10 there and he'll have nine after that. Uh, you go through, it, it's much more complicated than that, obviously, but it goes through and it calculates all of that ledger information. It's software, it does it fast. And it says, all right, we're going to link this so that it can't be removed. Uh, you're you're, you're going to make sure that there's a key that connects this transaction to that. So you can't easily change it and go, oh, no, this transaction happened before that. So now Tom owes us money. No. And the other reason you can't do that is you have multiple nodes. So each block is not just recorded in one place. Multiple users on the system copy the block, and software checks the blocks against others to ensure they're right. If one block is changed by Scott, let's say your what your worry happens, and Scott, you go in and say, ha ha, I'm going to change this dollar that Tom's giving me to $5 on my ledger. A thousand other users will look at that and go, nope, that, that block's corrupted. Uh, that's not what we have. We have $1, and it gets kicked out. Uh, what, the, what if what if me and eight other friends uh, that are nodes all collude and do it? Does that now, change? Anything? Okay, not eight other friends because you've got thousands of nodes, right? You have you have way more nodes than that. Sure. But that is a concern with Bitcoin because the validation is conducted by miners, and one of the concerns is if the miners go above fifty percent, like if everybody gets all the mining resources above 50%, they could control the network and it would become centralized. But that that's the issue. As long as you keep it uncentralized, then you don't have that intro. It, it, that if, you, if you get enough people to collude, then yes, suddenly you have a centralized system de facto. And that is a weakness to it. So there's lots of arguments in the Bitcoin community about how to make sure that you don't get all of those resources centralized with permissioned systems like they want to use for things like contracts and and big jim is talking about import and export uh you you have you have an organization running the entire network and so they basically say well, we're not going to let anybody in here to run a node we, we make sure that the people running the node are trustworthy and we still it's mostly in numbers you make it very difficult for someone to run enough nodes to be able to change that system. Well, plus, I mean, and I, and, and I even knew it when I said it, but the entire point of the technologies surrounding the creation of Bitcoin and how blockchains work and all of that, it, the entire idea is decentralization. So me colluding to a point of greater than 50% control would probably, A, would probably never get to that point, and B, if it ever did, I mean, the entire thing exists as an antithesis to control. So, so I, that makes sense to me that, that, that there's not, the security is by diversity, not by control. And that's a, that's a really unique idea when it comes to money. And that's the only reason I think it throws people. I know it's why it throws me because it's just, it's about money. It's about goods and its services and, and, it, and applying my brain to it being transacted, verified, and and linked and chained in this way is just such a new bit of thinking even though i guess banks have done this exact thing or the the results are the same it's just been controlled by the banks or the banking system well yeah and the, this is and, and you're like what if we what if we get eight people uh to collude it's like they won't those eight people will all be invalidated right <laughs> if you got eight people in a central clearinghouse to collude you could do some damage yeah. Right. So first of all, getting eight people to collude is more difficult than it sounds, right. uh, especially if they get caught. And you also have you make it way harder because you need way more than eight people. Uh, in fact, you don't need people. You need resources. You need to own nodes. So so you need to either flood the thing with nodes, which means you have to own a lot of machines. It's it's just very difficult. It's not impossible. And, and Bitcoin has had some fears that they were getting close to it happening. Uh, but it's a it's a trick to pull off. And and if you are controlling the network more, it may, it makes it even more difficult. Now, if you're controlling the network, obviously, the organization that controls the network is is the weak point there. Uh, but it's still way faster because you don't have a central clearinghouse. Everything just happens in software and it happens distributed and automatically. Uh, and it doesn't cost because you don't have someone running a server in a central area saying, okay, I am going to process this now and you owe me $49 for that. Uh, you have everyone who wants to participate in the system 
adding nodes to it, which makes it better and faster for everyone. And, and so they don't mind contributing the low cost of running those nodes because it pays off in the end. All right. So that all makes sense to me and it makes, it makes perfect sense. Um, if one of the, one of the factors in here always, and, and I'm probably wrong in this assumption, but it, it's a very, um, you know, everybody on the dark web's using Bitcoin. Everybody in places that are a little sneaky and dark on the internet, they're using Bitcoin for transactions. Um, it is the currency used to hold people's computers hostage when they run some sort of encryption thing, lock your computer down and say, well, we're gonna, you know, we're basically kidnapping your data unless you pay us $500 in Bitcoin or whatever. Um, so it already has that kind of reputation. My, my feeling has always been, well, that's because it's just not regulated in a way that traditional banking is if eight people collude in a company uh, in a banking system they are committing federal crimes and will be you know justly dealt with if they're caught if somebody does this in the blockchain or in bitcoin or something like that is this, are the are the stakes the same and so couldn't couldn't somebody as big as an isp who would suddenly be able to seize 50% because they happen to be the ISP through which all these nodes have to communicate through. Could they do some sort of hostile takeover of control and not be held to any sort of account? That sounds extreme, but you, do, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, I think you're answering your own question because the the efforts that you would have to go to to do that were, are going to be so noticeable <laughs> that that people are going to, going to step up and say, oh, well, hold on, you are violating several antitrust laws by doing that. You're violating money laundering laws for doing that. And it's it's not about Bitcoin. Again, you're, you're conflating Bitcoin and blockchain in your objection because you're saying Bitcoin is used to ransom people. The only reason Bitcoin is used to ransom people is that's a less traceable way. Uh, right. Because it doesn't go through a central server right now. Uh, yeah, but that doesn't mean blockchain right. has to work that way. Right. Blockchain is a public ledger and blockchain can say, okay, we're going to have a blockchain that's run by R3, which means we know who runs the nodes. So if anyone did something weird on our blockchain, we'd know exactly who did it. The, the issue with Bitcoin is it's so decentralized and open that somebody can anonymously run a node and create an account on it. But that's a Bitcoin issue, not a blockchain issue. Yeah, and the Bitcoin, there's obviously plenty of conversation can happen around why that's an issue on the Bitcoin side. On, on the blockchain side, I totally get it. This could be this like, it's like BitTorrent in a weird way. It's like BitTorrent can be used to download some illegal movies or that really rad technology is used in tons of ways we won't even know about because it's already doing great things on the internet and it's just working for us. So I, I totally get that. But what is then what is to stop like Wells Fargo or the World Bank or anyone else with a big organized, uh, you know, system of validation that they currently have in place? Why, why not? Why won't they move to this? Or maybe they are and will. I they don't are. Know. They want to. Uh, that, you know, the R3 consortium is having some people leave it because folks are like, eh, I don't really like the way it's run. That's good. Uh, that, that's what you want to happen is you want to have some conflict around how it's run so that you get a really good running blockchain for whatever it is you're developing it for. Uh, so yeah, Wells, Wells Fargo is investigating this city is invest. Everybody's investigating it. Uh, they want to make sure they've got it right before they switch from a system they all know how it runs to something new. Because as soon as they switch to the blockchain, all of us are going to go, hey, this didn't work, and it's because you didn't properly prepare. So <laughs> right now we're in that system of them saying, okay, we know theoretically this is going to work. How do we make it work in practice? Is, it, is, it, is there any worry that this is a profit center for them, these fees, the, the, um, the way that it's current? It's the opposite. Uh, it gets, you know, if I, if anyone's against this, it's the clearing houses because suddenly they don't get to charge. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's going to be a profit center because it will reduce costs for companies. And yeah, they might not pass all those savings along to you because they're banks and that's what they do, but it should still bring down costs for everybody. Okay. All right. Well, I think I, I feel like I know more about it than I did before. I yeah. Mean, if your goal today was to give Scott some enlightenment in the ways of the blockchain, I feel like it's happened. Um, it's super fascinating to me that what may end up happening, I mean, as you spoke, it hit me that one day you could see a future in 50 years where the impact of the internet can truly be studied because we've had enough time to think about everything that's come and gone. This sounds like the kind of thing, if widely adopted, could be the most impactful thing the internet ever did because it involves money 
and money involves everyday life in every way in every corner of the well, world. Well, and we didn't even get to that. It doesn't just involve money. It involves the supply chain. Uh, so IBM uses the example of diamond mining. Uh, when you when you mine a diamond, you want to know, okay, this is the right diamond, and it was mined here, and it went through these hands, uh, and we have a certification of the clarity and the color and the cut uh, that goes along with this diamond, and who's had it, and, and, and all the way through the supply chain from end to end, and the blockchain can do that too, because that ledger that says, oh, Tom sent a dollar to Scott can say this diamond with this cut clarity and color from this mine went through these hands. And the same thing can happen. Nobody can go and alter those records to embezzle some diamonds. Could you be a node today if you wanted? Could you be a... I am a node on the, block, on the Bitcoin blockchain. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, don't, I don't run very often and I don't have enough CPUs to really gain any free Bitcoins from mining. But yeah, I've got the entire block Bitcoin public ledger on my laptop. All right. Well, I, I, think, to... I think that's the other thing is we we have to explain this in human terms of like so and so does this and then adds it to the letter ledger and what we forget is this is all happening by software in nanoseconds yeah and it's that's not taking up a lot of data that's the difference and it's also not replicatable by humans humans can't do this level of whatever it is it's doing so it's it's a really hard comparison I I, I I take some comfort in in knowing that a lot of people are like me so they scratch their head at this and and feel like everything they've ever known about money is a lie because this this seems like this crazy way advanced way of looking at it that we're just not used to so maybe the the long tail on this is just education and people getting yeah. used to the idea and figuring it out another jay martin in our chat room uh has a story about a farm in provo utah mm. using uh blockchain <laughs> a farm yeah well i gotta look that up uh, uh, it's loading slowly for me. Merchant Spotlight, Lene Ferme, uh, apparently, is using Bitcoin and blockchain. You can find it on blockchain.com. We'll oh. throw it in the show notes as well. 